Veg, uh, uh basically organized uh, this panel. Um, I'll introduce him shortly, but he put together a blockbuster cast of people uh, to talk to us about China. Uh, so thank you, Sebastian, for basically organizing this panel. Um, going first is Professor Peter Zero, who is a professor of history at the University of Connecticut. Uh, his research focuses on modern Chinese thought and culture, and he's spending uh, the month here in Paris uh, giving a series of talks. He had one talk at the Collège de France last, last week, and then there will be several talks uh, at, in several seminars. So if you're around Paris and you want to hear more about Peter's work, uh, you still have some opportunities after this, this, uh, this conference. So uh, I'll just hand it over to Peter directly. OK, thank you. Can I? Yeah, I'd like to do this. Okay, thank you for coming. If I'm standing up, I figure I'm less likely to fall asleep while I digest the lunch. Um, but uh, if you close your eyes for a short rest um, or need to stand up, that's definitely not a problem. Uh, my paper is called Hopes Dashed. Chinese interpretations of the Great War. I want to look mostly at the period um, right between 1917 and 1919. So it's not really so much 1919 and on as how the Chinese get to 1919 and um, how we can understand that. So to begin with, I know um, most of you are not uh, historians of China as such. Um, you Probably most of you are somewhat familiar with a kind of standard <clears throat> grand narrative of modern Chinese history in which the, um, the negotiations of the Versailles Treaty in 1919 in China are sort of the equivalent of the May 4th movement. The May 4th movement refers most specifically to student demonstrations in Beijing that were opposed to the Versailles Treaty on the grounds that it looks like the negotiators were turning Germany's concessions in, Japan, uh, in China, basically control over Shandong province, turning those concessions over to Japan instead of returning them to China, which many people thought was going to happen based on sort of Wilsonian ideas, the 14 points, um, the, the, the way they thought the world was going. Students took to the streets on May 4th. Some of the, in Beijing, uh, some of them um, went to the house of China's uh, former ambassador to Japan and were going to um, beat him up. Um, he, he escaped. Um, there were Chinese cabinet ministers uh, they found and did beat up. They also burned his house down. So the demonstrations turned violent very quickly which is sometimes left out of the story a bit. A um, number of students were arrested. More students took to the streets to uh, further the original protest and then protest the arrest of the students. Uh, the movement grew and grew across uh, not just Beijing, but other Chinese cities as well, led to boycotts of Japanese <coughs> goods, led to uh, general strikes um, in, in Shanghai in particular. So it really was a very massive thing. Um, but what was it exactly? So in one standard story of the May 4th demonstrations, Mao Zedong said, um, here is the origins of modern Chinese communism, a particularly nationalist form of communism. Um, and it's true that the Communist Party was officially formed in 1921 by some of the people who were leaders or participants in the original May 4th demonstrations. So here's a story of student patriotism leading to stronger nationalism and radicalization. <clears throat> then if you go back a bit, there's another story that looks at the, the sort of intellectual and cultural background of the May 4th movement of 1919 as rooted in ideals um, basically of democracy, surrounding the slogan of science and democracy, which had been promoted over the previous two years by some of the people who become uh, leaders of the, of the movement. 
This has led historians to sort of talk about the May 4th movement in two ways. One of which emphasizes radicalization based on, on nationalism, a turning away from a kind of faith in Woodrow Wilson to a new faith in Lenin, who seemed to be describing the world more accurately. It's one story, Mao Zedong's story. And another story um, is interested sort of in May 4th as a, as a liberal movement, as a way of trying to found new political principles that would, that, that would be the basis of opposition and reform to dictatorial warlord regimes that had come to approximate power in China. So if that's sort of the grand narrative, <coughs> all of these different versions accept 1919 as an important turning point. And I'm not here to refute that or sort of engage in dramatic revisionism. Um, I think some of the other papers will add considerably to the story, uh, but I want to add nuance to what's going on. So key to the story of May 4th is the sense of um, what my paper calls hopes dashed or disillusionment, um, <clears throat> faith that the, the Great War, what the Chinese always called the European War, uh, would lead to a better world um, for many reasons, but partly including the wisdom of the people <coughs> creating the Versailles Treaty as they thought of it. So this was a kind of illusion that led to disillusionment. But there were also people who never were really illusioned in the first place, who took the view that the European war was simply a struggle among imperialist powers for uh, spoils of the rest of the world, um, and when it ended or how it ended uh, wasn't going to be very important. Another way of thinking about this is that um, the Versailles Treaty itself um, was not so important in China. It was, it was perhaps a catalyst to demonstrations that were really rooted in Chinese protests over Chinese political conditions, uh, but also larger questions about how to reshape traditional society and culture. So um, having said that, uh, there, is, there is a story of if not illusion, certainly of hope and disillusionment. For many thinkers of the period, we're talking about university professors, publishers, editors, journalists, um, and students. For many of these people, um, uh, how do I want to put this? Uh, the war represented, in the end, something of a victory of right over might. Uh, so remember, China joined the war late uh, in 1917. Um, it didn't commit soldiers, but it sent several hundred thousand workers to <coughs> England and France to basically replace the soldiers in the warehouses and factories um, and, uh, and in shipping, so that uh, China <coughs> did have a stake in the war that uh, intellectuals and students were very aware of, um, including, including many future members of the Chinese Communist Party. As, a, as then committed to the allied side, um, even some of the people who were quite cynical about what the war was really about, looked forward to the victory and saw the mighty military strength of Germany defeated. However, then, the Versailles Treaty represented a new awareness that um, righteousness was not enough by itself. Um, if you were actually going to defeat might, you needed might. Uh, you needed coercive power. <coughs> you needed um, term uh, Chang Chan might literally almost be translated the rights of strength. You needed to, the, the only way to defeat evil might was with righteous might. So notions of the importance of 
politics and creating a strong state sort of come back from a bit of a, a, bit of, um, um, a moment of quietness that they had previously been in. So what I want to do today is really just uh, look at two intellectuals to illustrate different aspects of how they understood the war and the, and the peace that followed. From its beginning, and so, and so a sort of note you need to keep in mind, when I say Chinese, I'm not talking about the 400 plus million Chinese who lived in China at the time, but a very small number of intellectuals. Um, but from the beginning then, Chinese had followed the events of what they called the European War. Um, they were interested in questions like uh, the new military technology, um, how uh, um, economics and labor should, uh, can be reconstituted. Uh, there are articles about the war and the women question, um, something central to China in the 19-teens, as well as informative articles about Balkan politics. And then at the end, the revolutions of both Russia and Germany were followed in great, great detail. In a sense, China had a good war. Um, imperialist pressures on China were relaxed, naturally enough, during, uh, during the war, with, with a partial exception of Japan's growing interest in China um, from, from 1914 onward. So I want to talk about one particular person. Uh, his name is Yuan, uh, Tsai Yuan Pei. He was president of Peking University. He's not a marginal figure, um, pretty much a philosopher and sort of general public intellectual by training. Um, in March 1919, he gave a speech to students observing that the war had transformed every aspect of the world so that now China has to um, change as well. And he promoted what he called cosmopolitanism. Um, as a professional educator, he wanted the schools in China to be repositioned to promote good character and qualities of citizenship. Now, this is, in, in terms of Tsai Yuan Pei's personal philosophy, this is not the ultimate goal of education, but it was what China needed at the time, kind of utilitarian citizenship. Um, he specifically says, in the post-war world, Old forms of education were outdated. The war itself had revealed their faults. He looked to the Versailles Peace Conference as uh, a route <coughs> to disarmament that was spending, uh, leading to the end of um, uh, what he called militants, citizens, education, or attitudes toward, um, toward war. The war had also, he thought, awakened people to the evils of religions based on the persecution of other religions. So cosmopolitanism then for Tsai Yuan Pei represented a new kind of open-mindedness. Um, now, at the same time, if I go back to 1918, as the war is, is still going on but reaching its end, this is an editorial from uh, an important Shanghai weekly magazine. It said this. The European war peace talks are starting, and these talks concern not only the various countries of Europe, but all of the international disputes across the world. We can make a clean sweep of things so that the European war will be the last war. The Chinese people have the responsibility to take this opportunity to justly advocate that the nation's sovereign rights be returned. So one call of the May 4th movement was for Chinese sovereignty and, quote, the return of rights, unquote. But another call was simply that of justice based on universal standards. The war had maybe cleared away a lot of evil old attitudes, and now it, the world is somehow ready to, to take on a more just uh, set of relationships. Lots of talk about the war as a turning point. Coming back to Tsai Yuan Pei, um, in another article from the middle of 1918, you could see the war was coming to an end. 
He called the war the most significant event in world history since the French Revolution. The French Revolution, he said, had Voltaire, uh, Rousseau, Voltaire, and Montesquieu. Then the late 19th century had Nietzsche, Tolstoy, and Kropotkin. Now, he thought the war had um, uh, shown Nietzsche and Tolstoy to be impractical thinkers. Uh, but as, again, the president of Peking University, he advocated Kropotkinism, anarchism, and mutual aid. So this is, this is a kind of radicalism that is at the same time central to mainstream intellectual thought. <coughs> Tyrann Pei then, at the end of the war, simply called the Allied victory of 1918 a victory of right over might, he says, of light over darkness. And these are his speeches to students that I think show where the students are coming from when we get to actual May 4th in the following year of 1919. Um, <coughs> okay, so... What I want to emphasize here is that unlike some of the leaders of May 4th movement who are maybe more centrally associated with it, who become founders of the Communist Party, Tyrann Pei's future direction was more toward the right. And um, he begins to emphasize the importance of social and political stability, and then down the road becomes a central supporter of the uh, Guomindang government when it comes to power through military <coughs> means a decade later. So there's more than leftism to May 4th. There are different strands of radicalism if we're going to call it radicalism. At the same time, interpretations of the <coughs> meaning of the peace depended on interpretations of the meaning of the war. And not all intellectuals regarded the war as a fight between good and evil, as I said. So these are people who are not so disillusioned by the Versailles Treaty because they were never illusioned in the first place, if illusioned is a word. Um, the intellectual I want to represent this view is a uh, sort of longtime editor of the most influential <coughs> monthly magazine in, uh, in China. His name is called Du Ya Tran. Um, I don't know exactly what to compare uh, the magazine that he edited too is sort of, if you're an American, um, maybe The Atlantic. It's a, it was a mix of uh, news and editorializing that uh, came out pretty regularly, uh, represented a variety of political positions and cultural voices. So in the summer of 1918, uh, while Du could see the uh, defeat of China coming, <coughs> He promoted not the idea that this represented a victory of right over might or light over darkness, um, but of developments in Europe that he thought might <coughs> prefigure developments in China. So he's extremely interested in the Russian Revolution, <coughs> though in Chinese terms he's not particularly radical, and he's even more interested in the um, revolution that, that breaks out in Germany. He has a complex analysis of how social relations in Europe have um, created a kind of alliance between the proletarians, the laboring classes, and intellectuals that are leading the world in a new direction. He doesn't think something like this can quite happen in China in the same way, but he's anticipating that um, eventually it will. So he too is optimistic at the beginning of 1919. Uh, he's talking about an awakening of the people in general. And he's not solely thinking of Chinese students and intellectuals, but at least urban residents more broadly. So he didn't think China, uh, he didn't think a kind of Russian style revolution was appropriate to China, but he nonetheless saw it as positive and important in world historical terms. Um, rather than, in the case of China, uh, he wanted to revive some Confucian notions that he thought had been in decline at least since the 19th century. We could call these traditional values. One is the notion that he called benefiting the people, which does have a legitimate Confucian genealogy. 
and promoting unity, which he now preached had to come from the bottom up and not the top down. So he's encouraging students to organize uh, societies for neighborhoods to come together, uh, including um, uh, rural villages. Uh, some of these ideas were not just ideas, but actually <coughs> reflected real developments in at least parts of Chinese society. He said that the previous revolution in China, which occurred in 1911, 1912, and had overthrown the last dynasty, he said this had failed. It had failed because China had attempted to copy the West. The political and social revolutions carried out in Europe rested both on a kind of European knowledge of the goals they wished to achieve, which was not available to Chinese. But on the other hand, as Chinese society developed in a progressive fashion based on its own culture, you wouldn't need revolution. You could have a set of, of reforms that would um, uh, bring China through the end of the Great War. Now, the other aspect of Du Yatran, which I think is generally true, is that although I've just been talking about how much intellectuals are following events in Europe and following the, uh, the negotiations going on in Paris, they're actually much more concerned with developments in China. And <clears throat> Du, for one, specifically says, just as the Europeans are now meeting in Paris to work out a new peace agreement, so the various militarized factions in China wreaking havoc across the land need to come together for a Chinese peace conference and work out their differences that way. So, okay, um, in the limited amount of time available, I'll turn to a kind of conclusion. Okay, I don't really have a conclusion, but let me cite the um, historian Dominic Sashmeyer who emphasizes a pair of themes in his discussion of Chinese understanding of the immediate post-war world. First, the global nature of the post-war notion that the times were ready for a fundamental reshaping of the political system. And second, this is Schachenmeyer's comment, the ideological struggles that arose in China in the wake of the war and Versailles stemmed from Chinese participation in the global circulation of ideas as much as from the local context. So, I agree with that way of putting it, but I want to emphasize the importance of the local context rather more than um, maybe Schachenmeyer does. That is to say, Chinese understandings of both the war and the peace that followed were based on their understandings of the tumultuous and, and horrific uh, uh, militarized nature of Chinese politics um, since the revolution of, of 1912 and even before the and even before the revolution. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Uh, I suppose we can think of it in these two ways, one of them as an event, the event of the day itself, the, the student protests, the, out, the outrage, um, and what Erez Manila has called the, the Wilsonian moment, the sense of great betrayal of the, the non-signing of the treaty of the two of the Chinese delegates in Paris a um, hundred years ago this week. Um, and then the second way to think about it is the sort of broader uh, cultural reinvention moment, this so-called new culture movement in which the impetus was to kind of sweep away the old and get rid of old thoughts and old culture and um, Confucianism especially came under huge attack. <clears throat> and it also involves a range of other sort of iconic uh, causes that May 4th intellectuals took, took up, including the popularization of uh, a vernacular language. So let's not speak an old classical language, let's speak the new vernacular language, uh, women's liberation, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy, all of these um, catchwords. And this is a very potted summary and there's lots more complexity there, but essentially um, these are two of the major ways that the May 4th movement has been talked about. And here we see a picture of <clears throat> the uh, Beijing students, um, the May 4th movement, seeing, seeing as been be, seen as being a very uh, Beijing-centered movement. <clears throat> um, what I want to do um, in this talk is to, is to think a little bit about how, um, as Dipesh Chakrabarti has pointed out, this phenomenon of political modernity, this, this notion of, of what it meant to be modern um, in, in the 20th century is, is absolutely freighted uh, with, with what he called the burden of European thought. Um, what can I think of political modernity, he says, without all these other, um, uh, without em embedding concepts like the state and social justice and all the things in red which I've highlighted here, which were, which were catchphrases of the May 4th movement, impossible to think about that without the weight of European thought. Um, and uh, I want to suggest a little bit that this image of the diffusion of Wilsonianism um, into all corners of the world and this notion of self-determination elides uh, some of elides what Peter was referring to at the end of his talk, which was the, the kind of localized dynamics in which those, those ideas were taken up um, in different corners of the world. Um, and it also kind of fuels um, a, a quite problematic um, a genealogy that Europe is a sort of progenitor of all that is modern in the world, or perhaps maybe to put it more provocatively, that inside every modern Asian nationalist is a true American Democrat hoping to get out. You know, and that's it's a very problematic term, which is, which is dissuaded again and again by events over the 20th century. So um, I want to do that by, by sort of highlighting, and I, I, I operate here from a kind of position of epistemic disadvantage, which is that I have to explain a lot more of the background um, to, to, to uh, this audience than I perhaps would have to in a more specialized audience. So I really just want to highlight two um, flows, that uh, diasporic flows, that I think help us to think through and provincialize Wilsonianism um, with um, Asian conceptions of, or Asia, Asian genealogies of freedom and modernity that may not have had that much to do actually with Wilson um, in, in 1919. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about these two translocal flows. <clears throat> Um, both of them are predicated on regional diasporic networks of intellectuals and social connection that I think kind of fall out of the May 4th story for reasons I hope to return to in the conclusion. Both of them are centered around um, Hokkien intellectuals, so Fujianese uh, from Fuzhou, um, intellectuals who uh, were one of the main streams of diasporic movement into Southeast Asia. Um, they, both of these flows complicate the two deep-rooted strands of progress fictions that are embedded and entwined in the May 4th story. On the one hand, a Western-oriented Wilsonian self-determination modernity, and on the other hand, actually, a Chinese modernity that takes up that story and makes it the foundational myth of Chinese nationalism um, uh, uh, ever, ever since. The, the, the specters of uh, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy continue to rear their head um, over the course of the, um, the 20th century, which I think perhaps Jeff Wasserstrom will speak to um, soon. Um, so, uh, I want to start with the first set of networks uh, which are, emerge around this guy, a Fujianese intellectual called Wu Dunmin, um, who actually was the editor of a paper uh, called The Benefit the Masses Daily, going back to um, uh, Peter Zara's point earlier. Um, and he uh, was a Hokkien, uh, he's from Yongchun, a native place um, 
his native place community was in Yongchun. Uh, and he made this paper by canvassing capital from um, wealthy capitalists all over the, what the Chinese call the Nanyang, the Southeast South Seas. Um, he went to the Dutch East Indies, he went to Manila, he, he gathered editors around him from, from the region and, and hoped to, to create in it a kind of progressive newspaper that would um, comment on issues of the day. <clears throat> and he set it up on 24th May, 1919, um, uh, which is just on the cusp of the May 4th movement. Um, he will become a really central figure um, in uh, the, the eruption uh, in June, uh, at the end of June 1919, of what was, I suppose, has been called the May 4th movement in, in Singapore and Malaya, uh, which is a little bit later than the May 4th movement, so we can say that May 4th in Southeast Asia happened on 19th June. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he played a central role. He, he wrote scores and scores of articles in the lead up to, uh, to the uh, riots that erupted on 19 June. He wrote a primer on how to do boycotts. Um, he, he, um, uh, and it worked because what happened is that on 19 June, Japanese shops all over Singapore were, 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 were looted, their goods burned in the streets. Um, and in other parts of Singapore, the altercations went beyond burning. Shots were fired. The Manchester Regiment was, was dug out and deployed um, across the whole of the peninsula. And the British imposed martial law almost immediately, leading to a spate of repressions in the press, um, the registration of Chinese schools, and so forth. It was a, it was a major um, intervention um, in 1919. That's what it looks like in, in um, Malaya. But um, Wudemann did this by, by sort of invoking um, Chinese nationalism. He said, you know, as uh, the quote up here says, our compatriots must inflame their patriotism all over the world. We must make conferences, make plans. And this galvanizing of the kind of global Chinese diaspora was very much part of the May 4th movement, um, evidenced by the fact that uh, around this time, this week, um, 100 years ago, it was a crush of enraged Chinese students who were in Paris uh, around the time of the treaty that, that literally barricaded the Hotel Lutetia, Lutetia. Um, and and to, to try to prevent the Chinese delegation from signing this god awful treaty. So, um, this, this global Chinese diaspora was, was galvanized in service of this. And that, that's very much the story that fits with the Chinese idea of the May 4th movement, that it was uh, the origins of Chinese patriotism. But in fact, the story is more complicated than that. And I'm not going to go too much into how complicated, but um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. One of them is that, as Peter Zero um, nicely pointed out earlier, Wu Dunmin was not a Wilson. He um, was very much plugged into um, a, a fraternal network of anarchist newspapers that stretched across the South Seas, the, the Sipin Rebao, the, the Surabaya Daily, the, the Samarang um, Common People's Weekly, um, another paper based in Manila. He, he, his, his first, his first um, essay in the newspaper was um, called On the Class System and How It Corrupts Society, and it traces the historical emergence of class and the growing gap between rich and poor, and he proposed anarchism as a solution to social injustice. Um, he also invoked Kropotkin. He, um, essentially, in the colonial spaces of, of Southeast Asia, there was no space for the story of liberal Wilsonianism to develop because the society was so, um, uh, it, it was so stratified, and there was not space for that kind of liberal discourse to emerge. And that is, um, and so critique in this form had to take had to take a kind of radical tenure from the beginning. In other words, these um, anarchist intellectuals were, were, had no space to be disillusioned by Wilsonianism because, as Peter Zara says, they were never illusioned in the first place. <clears throat> um, he is... Uh, he is arrested uh, after writing a series of so-called Minzu letters in July, um, in which he writes an essay on self-determination with entirely Bolshevik um, uh, language, uh, invoking uh, models of co commun uh, communal living in Russia and Hungary. Um, and then he gets arrested, and he defends anarchism to his last, he says. The, the, the resident asks him, have you ever promoted anarchism? And he says, yes, I have that ism aims to eliminate Xiangquan, which is the word that um, Peter mentioned earlier, um, kind of hard to translate, but something like repressive authority. Um, <clears throat> and he defended it to, to, to the last. So this is a different genealogy, that's my one point, about, of, of so-called self-determination, which has really nothing to do with Wilson. Um, and then my other point, um, in, in, in these colonial space, diasporic colonial spaces, if we look at the, um, the uh, this 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 rhetoric of uh, anti-Japanese class 
um, uh, um, solidarity came up against the sociological realities of Chinese societies in Southeast Asia, which is the extraordinarily internally heterogeneous um, uh, makeup of Chinese communities in Southeast Asia. So you see the second column there of British Malaya. Notice that um, uh, unlike the other places in Southeast Asia, the uh, distribution of Hokkien and Cantonese intellectuals were almost equal. And in fact, um, a lot of the riots that happened in June that, that summer uh, were, were differentiated along sub-ethnic lines, i.e. Cantonese destroying Hokkien property and so forth. And there was, um, that's, that's actually been a precedent in many of the kinds of uprisings in British Malaya, for example, in 1912, when there was similar so-called inter-bang or inter-sub-ethnic uh, rivalry uh, that was disguised or, or elided as sort of Chinese rioting. <clears throat> Um, indeed, we know that police reports and intelligence show that the boycott in uh, June of 1919 was on the whole led by anarchist organizations um, in, in, in Malaya. <clears throat> Um, and the other point about the stratification of colonial society is that the discourse of, um, of uh, anti-Japanese nationalism uh, was completely co-opted by um, the bourgeois capitalist class in Singapore um, in the form of the Singapore uh, Chinese Chamber of Commerce who colluded with um, British to, to agree that the, the, the riots had to be put down by force. Um, so there was really no space for a different kind of discourse to, to emerge in um, colonial society. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I will also add that the, uh, the, the, the Chinese newspaper that Wu Dunmin was the head of also fell to inter-ethnic rivalry. He was expelled um, in, the, in the late in 1919, a Cantonese-dominated network of intellectuals mostly based around a man called Liu Kefei, who was um, the brother of a major Guangzhou analyst, Liu Shifu, um, took over the editorship of the paper and um, fell out with all the other Hokkien intellectuals in the paper. So, so there, there are complexities to the story of the so-called global Chinese nationalism that, that can only be unpicked at the, at the level of the local um, and, and, and the regional, <clears throat> and which are completely elided by this notion of um, the spread of, the glorious spread of Wilsonianism to the rest of the world. So that's one set of networks. Um, my second set of networks um, uh, are around these two individuals. So if my first set of networks suggest a kind of uh, distorted outspilling of May 4th into the diaspora. I want to use the second set of networks to talk about the, um, the re uh, largely invisible reverse flow of the diaspora into China's May 4th movement. And this set of networks um, is also around this uh, two sojourning Hokkien's, uh, Li Denghui and He Baoren. Um, both of them were central actors in the May 4th movement, in, not in Beijing, but in Shanghai. Um, they were both uh, prominent figures in Fudan University, which had been at the center of mobilizing student protests in Shanghai in 1919, playing a role not unlike that of Peking University in Beijing. Um, and both of them were um, extraordinarily um, mobile and um, diasporic individuals. Li Denghui was born in Batavia in the Dutch East Indies. He grew up speaking Baba Malay and Hokkien and English. Uh, he moved to Singapore where he was ed educated by Methodists who then dispatched him off to Yale uh, where he did a degree. And then he came back to Batavia in 1901 and tried to set up a Yale Institute <laughs> even before Yale set up in Singapore in, in 2000 and whatever it was. Um, <laughs> He, just, he set up the first Yale Institute in Southeast Asia. Um, of course, it didn't last very long. But anyway, <laughs> um, in 1903, he was denied entry into the US because of the exclusion laws at the time, which embittered him uh, towards um, global regimes of governance. He came back to Singapore, and then he ended up in Shanghai in 1905. <clears throat> the other guy, He Baoren, um, was born in Xiamen in Fuzhou, but he moved to Singapore in his youth. He was educated in a Hokkien school. Um, and then he eventually ended up at Fudan University in 1913, having shuttled back and forth between Nanjing, uh, Jinan, and Singapore, and Penang. <clears throat> And then he became very active in student politics and affairs, um, and then uh, became president of the Debating Society, the Moral Improvement Society, and the editor of the Fudan Journal. <clears throat> um, and so in, in May 1919, when the Shanghai Student Union was established, this guy, He Baoren, was elected, this overseas China educated Chinese guy, was um, elected its student, its president. When on the 1st of June, the student representatives from all over China resolved that a Republic of China Student, of union, student Union should be set up, um, He Baoren was elected its vice president. 
The other guy, Li Denghui, was the president of Fudan University, but he also founded an organization in 1905 called the World Chinese Students Association, which actually in 1919 ended up being the place where all these meetings were hosted um, in, in Xing'an district. So what is this World Student Organization? <clears throat> It was um, founded in the summer of 1905. Its origins are very hazy, um, but it's most well known for sort of setting up this uh, work study program which sent Chinese students to Europe <clears throat> in the 1920s. Um, it was the first student oriented association which promulgated unity on a nationwide basis and to, and to um, uh, pay attention to the social, cultural, and political reform of, idea, uh, of, of, uh, of China. Um, and it was a diasporic imagined organization. The original idea for it, as far as my research has found, is that it was um, suggested by a man called Xie Zhan Tai in a letter he wrote to, uh, to the guy down here. Um, in a letter he wrote in October 1904 to a Penang Chinese medical doctor called Wu Lian De who is better known in China as the plague doctor because he was dispatched by the Qing government to, to kind of fight plague in Manchuria. Um, but Xia Zhantai was born in Sydney. Um, he's better known today as the founder of the South China Morning Post. But at the time, he was part of the revolutionary network called the Xin Zhonghui, or the Sun Yat-sen organization. Um, and so both of them got together along with Li Denghui in June 1905. They met up on, on, on this guy's roof garden and had a little powwow and said, let's set up this, this organization. And so they did. Li Denghui went to Shanghai. He set up the World um, Chinese Student um, uh, Organization <coughs> uh, Association uh, with um, a few Hong Kong Chinese as, as um, uh, vice presidents, presidents and uh, board of directors, but they also had a Penang branch in which this guy and the guy on the end there, Gu Li Ting, would be the, the heads. He also, Li Denghui also set up branches in Penang, Qingdao, Singapore, Hawaii, and Fuzhou. He connected with Hokkien's in all of these places, including he went to Fuzhou in 1906 and got this woman, the first uh, uh, woman, woman doctor, one of the first women doctors to get a medical degree outside China. She went to Philadelphia to set up the, uh, the Fuzhou branch of this organization. <clears throat> um, and I, I, in the longer paper, I want to argue that this, this organization was, was fundamentally a culturally syncretic thing. It was, it was imbued with very um, modern, or self-consciously modern ideas about what a modern civil society should look like. Um, it was one of the earliest to, um, uh, it set up debating societies because it believed in the, um, the need for um, uh, informed civil discourse. And in 1917, a woman uh, came third in their debating competitions. Very exciting moment. Um, it, has, it had always been very open to women's participation. Um, it was one of the first to, um, to advocate openly for um, the introduction of one common language of Guanghua to, um, to, to unify all of China. It was very early to do so. That discourse would only really take off in what is now known as the new culture movement. <clears throat> Um, and it's not surprising because in the, in the mixed dialect spaces of, of British Malaya and, and Singapore, um, cross finding a language to unite all the disparate um, dialect groups was one, a really central um, problem which, um, was, uh, which can explain why this common language idea was um, important before it became really, really important in, um, in, in China. <clears throat> um, so the... the, the I guess these kinds of diasporic linkages that I wanted to concretely talk about here suggest a kind of regional ecology of idea circulation whose intellectual influences have been one of the casualties of the narrowing of the May 4th movement. And now Jeff will probably talk about the way in which this May 4th spirit has been co-opted by successive regimes, by the Communist Party as its founding myth story, by the Kuomintang as saying that the Communists didn't really understand the modernity of May 4th. As these spaces closed for ideological alternatives, I, I want to say that these diasporic individuals became invisibilized. They were absorbed into unproblematic narratives of either Chinese patriotism on the one hand, or if you, um, with someone like Li Denghui, um, a kind of uh, syncretically problematic person. Um, you know, he uh, was a Christian, uh, and Christianity became problematic for, for May 4th. As just two years after May 4th, Li uh, would be on the organizational uh, committee of a, um, a conference that would eventually lead to the anti-Christian movement in the 1920s. Um, uh, 
He was also a kind of Confucianist in his ideas, in the sense that the school that he tried to set up in, in Batavia, that Yale Institute, uh, was, was done in conjunction with a, a, an avowedly Confucianist school, which was the kind of, which at the time was the vehicle for a kind of radical reimagination of what Confucianism could be for societies that wanted to modernize. So it wasn't the kind of backwards, superstitious set of ideas that it would become vilified in the May 4th movement, but rather a site of modernity in itself. And, and this actually carries on beyond the diaspora. Confucius is translated into, into Malay in Indonesia and in Singapore and Malaya. It becomes a, 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 a language of modernity in, in, um, uh, beyond the diaspora, in, in, um, in particularly among Sino-Malay intellectuals in Java. And there's also a sense in which um, not just Chinese, but, but non-Chinese were also watching modern developments um, by that, that the strides that Chinese were taking to become modern. This is an Indonesian intellectual, Abdul Rivai, who uh, was, was Dutch educated, but, but is, can be seen here in this quote, sort of looking enviously over the shoulder of his Chinese compadres in Java, saying, look how they've become so modern, let's try and learn from them. Um, again, nothing to do with Wilson, um, just looking horizontally across at their neighbors. Um, uh, and, and we have also a woman here, um, Kartini, Radeng Ajeng Kartini, who was a, uh, a Javanese um, a noblewoman who uh, is, can be seen here expressing great joy that Chinese women had become modern before Javanese women and that she should really start learning from them. <clears throat> there's lots of stories like this to tell that I don't really want to get into because there's no time, but um, my, my, my larger point is that um, the, this, these, particularly these last two individuals, resurrect a kind of possibility for a, a, uh, a non-secular um, origins of uh, modernist thinking in, uh, in diasporic and colonial spaces that are, are, are ill-served by the, by the hegemonic conflation of both Western-oriented modernity and also the claiming by China of a kind of hegemonic patriotic Chineseness that elides a range of other possible spaces and genealogies for thinking about the, 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 uh, the modern and, and freedom um, in, in the 20th century. It, it, it's the, these, these, this double reinforced progress narrative has freighted and haunted perhaps any, this moment, the May 4th moment, any, more than any other moment in China's modern history, oppressed by a century of enlightenment discourse of secularist modernity. <clears throat> So let me then just end here by leaving off with, with Chakra Body repurposed for our 1919, um, 1920 moment. Wilsonian thought is at once both indispensable and inadequate in helping us think through the experiences of political modernity in non-Western nations. And provincializing Wilson becomes the task of exploring how this thought, which is now everybody's heritage and which affects us all, may be renewed from and for the margins. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel, for that really exciting paper. Um, next up is Sebastian, Sebastian Veg, who, who is a professor of contemporary history of China at the EHESS. And he has a particular interest in intellectuals and the public sphere. And hot off the press, presses is his latest book, Minjian, The Rise of China's Grassroots intellectuals, which came out just last month, so please go and find a copy. And I want to once again thank Sebastian for organizing this panel. However you want. Do I need the, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Well, thanks. It's working, yes. Thanks so much to uh, Albert and Stephen for this wonderful conference, not only uh, this very uh, fitting uh, venue, but also I'd say this very kind of decentering and subversive spirit that we've been experiencing since this morning, which I think is really very, very stimulating and especially very uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, yeah, very stimulating for people who uh, work on areas which are not always included in the kind of core of uh, uh, international or global history. So, uh, well, without any further ado, let me move on to my uh, paper, which is <coughs> on uh, basically uh, uh, 
getting into the nitty gritty of uh, who actually were the Chinese people involved in making public opinion around the time of the Versailles Treaty. So um, uh, basically uh, the connection between uh, the negotiations leading to the treaty and the mass demonstrations in Beijing and throughout China, uh, as previous speakers have reminded us, are widely seen as foundational for modern China. Um, so we know that news was transmitted from Paris to Beijing and to other places uh, about the uh, uh, concessions that had been made by the Chinese delegation that the Allies were not prepared to uh, uh, restore uh, German rights in Shandong to China. Um, of course, the movement uh, further involved other aspects like police repression, defense of academic freedom, but, and mobilization of workers and merchants. But whatever the exact uh, chronology of events, basically this movement uh, became a huge uh, time of social and political upheaval that lasted a month and then reverberated on through over many years. Um, Ultimately, as you know, the negotiators, the Chinese negotiators, took the decision on their own not to sign the Versailles Treaty since they were receiving contradictory in instructions from the government in Beijing. The uh, president reversed his view of the uh, need to sign the treaty, but this, his late last instruction didn't reach the negotiators in time. So they were very much informed by um, not so much instructions from their government as by this rising trend of public opinion. So John Dewey, who had arrived to Peking on May 1st, 1919, a very uh, good time to visit China for sure, uh, observed uh, popular opinion has taken things into its own hands. So what I want to do here briefly is to look into <coughs> what, what is popular opinion in China in 1919. So, um, Popular opinion, of course, has different dimensions. Uh, uh, we always look at its national dimension, but it also has a global and a local uh, dimension. Um, well, there is indeed a plausible argument to be made. This is something that China historians have long debated, that in the series of events leading from the acceptance of Japan's 21 demands in 1915 to the May 4th movement in 1919, uh, we can see the emergence of a nationwide public opinion in China and even of the modern democratic polity of the idea of an accountable government. Um, nonetheless, there are several dimensions to this process. So the Wilsonian moment is one of these dimensions. It was certainly conducive to the formation of an international public opinion, but um, it also uh, played out on other uh, levels. So on the national level with the issue of uh, China's own government and its need to be accountable in making major foreign policy decisions, uh, which were effectively being taken by an unelected government without any form of democratic control control since parliament had been dissolved. Um, but there is also a kind of more grassroots, and Albert kindly mentioned my interest in Minzian and grassroots networks and dynamics. So what I think is interesting to do here is to look at take intellectual history sort of down one level to the grassroots and see how public opinion actually works. Who are the people who make public opinion uh, uh, in a kind of more bottom-up manner? Um, so I'm going to try to argue that this aspiration, uh, democratic or national aspiration, could not have had the effect that it had without two other factors. So first of all, the modern press and the early stages of a form of civil society, um, but also so that these two new phenomena were based on uh, pre-modern networks of hometown ties. So um, by retracing the details of how the news of the Versailles negotiations reached China, I'm going to try to underscore uh, how the global dimension is di embedded not only in national trends, but also in these local networks. So a kind of compliment to uh, Rachel's transnational uh, 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 angle. Um, so, well, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. We, we do know that uh, uh, one of the decisive players in alerting Chinese public opinion to the situation in Paris was the famous intellectual Liang Qichao, uh, who was an unofficial observer at the peace conference. Um, he was uh, on a longer mission to Europe, which ended up completely changing his political views, but he'd also been appointed by the government as a kind of unofficial advisor to the Chinese delegation. So on April 24th, 
uh, Liang sent a telegram uh, to the Citizens Diplomatic Association in Peking, which described the danger of uh, <coughs> losing Shandong, basically, which was published um, on May 4th in the Shenbao, which was at that time the major newspaper in Shanghai. But before that, it had already been read and discussed, and it, the news had been disseminated through uh, other channels. So in particular, Lin Changmin, the head of the uh, uh, Citizens Diplomatic Association, wrote a separate article for the Beijing Chenbao, the morning newspaper, which was published on May 2nd under the title, Diplomatic Alarm, A Call to Citizens. So this is kind of the uh, official narrative. But what I want to look at here is that there are also some less well-known players involved in the story. So one of these less well-known players it was what was known as the Paris News Service, or the Bali Tongxin She. Um, this was a very makeshift organization with roots in local networks, but it was also the first Chinese press agency established by Chinese journalists in Europe. Its history is directly connect connected with the Young China Association. Now, uh, you have their uh, uh, publication on the PowerPoint here. Uh, this, this association had been informally convened uh, uh, in June 1918. Um, it had seven founding members. Uh, all of whom were from Sichuan province, except one who's very well known, who's Li Dajiao. Uh, but among these, so he was there for other reasons, but among these, it was very much a Sichuanese association. And among these six Sichuanese founding members, three of them had been classmates in the same class in high school. And so to give you the kind of gist of my talk, um, what I'm going to uh, highlight here is that May 4th reunited these three people in a network that spanned from Paris to Beijing and back to Chengdu and put these three high school classmates from uh, Chengdu High School back in touch in disseminating news of the Versailles Treaty. Um, so, uh, this association, I want to say a couple of words about, again, to complexify the story as, as both Peter and Rachel before me have already uh, uh, done. Um, Zhou Taishuan, one of the founding members, described Young China as being strongly united by a common feeling that politics were unbearable, that China was in decline, but that the West did not offer a way out of its predicament. And this, I would say, is the kind of background that informs this whole story. Um, I found an interesting letter from Wang Guangqi, who was the uh, first uh, founding chair of this association, uh, dated May 20th, 1919, so right in this period, in which uh, uh, Wang Guangqi describes the United States as a country governed by money worship and money lords, just as China <laughs> is governed by warlords. Um, the letter concludes with Wang Guangxi's preference for what he calls social democracy based on equality of condition rather than political democracy based on institutions, which is what the U.S. was considered to be. But at the same time, uh, and this is also very uh, important to remember that people were quite well informed in China at this time, it criticizes Leninist state socialism as being too restrictive of people's freedoms. And Wang Guangxi's later career uh, also bears out this kind of uh, reservation. So, um, well, Young China went on to become a very important uh, association, but then also uh, it sort of fell apart because of the political conflicts among its members who all went in different uh, di directions. Um, so, well, what I'm just gonna do is introduce you to some of these people, just as Rachel did. So some of these Sichuanese classmates who played uh, such an important role in uh, this story. So, uh, Basically, all of these people were born between 1891 and 1895. Um, many, three of them were born in 1891 and two, so those are the high school classmates. Uh, Wang Guangqi is probably the most well-known of them. So he was uh, a famous journalist. Uh, he was instrumental in setting up uh, Young China. As I said, he also founded the Beijing Work Study Mutual Assistance Groups, one of these anarchist groups that um, uh, Peter has written about. Uh, he was a prominent advocate of the New Village Movement. But then uh, uh, later, he also kind of left politics and left uh, for Germany, where he studied musicology. And he became a professor uh, in Bonn, where he died tragically in the University Library of Estonia stroke uh, in 1936, and his ashes were eventually brought back and buried on Zhou Taishuan's family land, so on one of the other uh, founding members of the society. Um, 
I'm saying this because each of them actually died in a different place. So you'll have one, one died in Europe, one died in China, one died in Taiwan, and one died in the United States, and they all follow different political trajectories. Um, Zheng Qi uh, was a classic kind of um, nationalist revolutionary. He was a Tomenhui member, Revolu Sun Yat-sen's Revolutionary Alliance. He was elected to the first parliament in 1912. Uh, he attended the French Jesuit University, Aurora University in Shanghai. So several of these people also had Aurora connections, which brought them to France. Um, he, was, he became a journalist in, in the years after graduating, and he was actually in Shanghai during this time uh, before then joining the uh, uh, Paris uh, uh, News Service in the fall of 1919 after the, uh, uh, after the uh, protest. So he uh, was one of the Young China members who strongly opposed communism. He was a, a founder of the uh, Chinese Nationalism Youth Corps. Um, he, uh, 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 tried to win Sun Yat-sen over to his views, but uh, he later uh, drew closer to Chiang Kai-shek, and he's the one who eventually left China for the United States in 1948. Um, Zhou Taishuan uh, was uh, uh, perhaps the most, all the, all the memoirs keep pointing out that he was penniless, um, <laughs> so he uh, arrived to Shanghai uh, without any money in pocket and relied on various connections, and pretty much the same happened when he sailed to France uh, without speaking French, uh, without any uh, work contract in hand, and so he was the person who was instrumental in setting up the agency um, in Paris. He later studied for a doctorate in biology, and he uh, eventually returned to China. He was also a great promoter of eugenics uh, in China, and he um, uh, had, I think he fathered 15 children. Um, there are discussions about his uh, <laughs> a, a refusal of birth control linked to his belief in eugenics. Anyway, so he's the one who stayed in China and eventually uh, uh, became a, uh, a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Mm, Li Huang, uh, another basically journalist and academic, um, so he was the other person who was very instrumental in setting up the uh, Paris News Agency. Uh, he studied European history in Paris and then eventually he uh, also returned to China to teach history. He also took his certain distance with the Communist Party. Interestingly, Li Huang was a, a delegate at the 1945 San Francisco Conference, so he actually experienced uh, two of these uh, conferences that we uh, talked about over lunch. He turned down several offers to enter Chiang Kai-shek's government in the late 1940s, and in 1949, he and another member of the uh, 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 Young China Association moved to Hong Kong. Uh, um, he then eventually moved to Taiwan in the 1960s, where he died at uh, the ripe old age of uh, 96. And then finally, Li Jieren, who is known as uh, one of the uh, great novelists of the 20th century, who was uh, involved uh, in the railroad protection movement in Chengdu in 1911, which was sort of one of the preludes to the revolution of 1911. Uh, he, uh, he was the person in Chengdu who was on the receiving end of all of these newspaper articles. Uh, he eventually also went to study in France, but after the, uh, after the uh, events. So um, how am I doing on time? So moving on to the story of the uh, uh, Paris News Service, basically uh, this was something of a kitchen sink operation, as I said. Um, well, because previously international reports in Chinese papers were a monopoly of Reuters and other foreign news agencies, uh, Chinese newspapers were eager to have their own reporters uh, sending news from the uh, peace uh, negotiations. So um, when it was set up, they quite quickly found uh, newspapers that were interested in printing their dispatches, but um, uh, less willing to pay for the articles. So they found that their dispatches were printed, but then they did not receive any fees. So uh, uh, in particular, Joe Taisran, who as you remember was penniless, um, 
was in a difficult situation, so Li Huang, who was from a much more uh, uh, kind of uh, much richer family, claims to have introduced him to uh, Li Shizeng, one of the uh, leading anarchists in the work study movement, who happened to be on the same boat. It's not clear with whom he was on the same boat. Both so. Zhou Taishuan and Li Huang sailed from Shanghai to Paris on successive boats, <laughs> the first and the second boats to sail after the interruption of service during the war. Each claimed that Li, Ch Li Shizeng was on his boat. Um, <laughs> so Zhou Taishuan says, well, I knew Li Shizeng and that's how I was able to get support from him and other people in Paris. Uh, uh, Li Huang says, uh, uh, basically, uh, Zhou Taishuan didn't have a penny and didn't know how to survive in Paris, so I introduced him to Li Shizeng, who then put put him up in his tofu factory um, uh, within the workers' dormitory. So this was the beginnings of the uh, student, worker, student work movement. Um, eventually, they were able to rent a room in the Latin Quarter where they did translating, writing, printing, and sending. Um, so the highlight, as they recall it, of their, uh, of their career in the Paris News Service was that they were the first to send confirmed news to China that the U.S. had refused to endorse Chinese claims. Now, this news actually only reached China on May 5th, so after the May 4th movement, but nonetheless, it's a source of great pride that they reported it before um, any foreign agency. And they also remember, so that article is in the Shenbao, I, I, I found dug it out, I don't have time to go into it, but um, it also contains an interview with one of the members of the KMT delegation. So the Chinese delegation in Versailles was composed of people of the two competing governments. So there was the KMT government in Guangzhou and Canton and the uh, warlord government in Beijing. Um, Li Huang also remembers that uh, on the final days before the Versailles Treaty, they were able to talk to the Chinese delegation to ensure that they would not sign it, but the head of the delegation was the only person who refused to meet him, so they were very uh, worried that he, in the end, would escape through a back door and sign the treaty, so they surrounded his hotel in the Bois de Boulogne and, uh, uh, to ensure that he would not go to Versailles on June uh, 27th or 28th. It's not quite clear. So. Um, then comes the kind of story of the transmission of the news. So, uh, as I said, we had uh, uh, Zhou Taishuan and Li Huang in Paris. Uh, 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 <coughs> Sorry, that's a, a mistake there. Wang Guangqi was not in Paris, he was in Beijing, in Peking. Uh, so he uh, cabled the news uh, from Peking to Chengdu. Uh, Li Jieren was in Chengdu and ran the news from both the Paris Telegram and the Peking Telegram in his uh, Sichuanese newspaper. And this then provoked a scene which is also consigned in memory, memories of the movement where um, uh, this article was read out loud in the main university in Chengdu over breakfast by someone who later became a student leader uh, called Yuan Shizhao. Um, and the refectory then became a kind of meeting hall as the students started acclaiming the patriotic protesters and booing the Beijing government, calling to dismiss the three traitors and to refuse to sign the treaty. So despite Sichuan's remote position, um, the city of Chengdu actually does not appear on the map that's included in the conference program, so I thought that was an interesting uh, kind of statement as to how important it was for Western uh, map makers at that time. Of course, it was a large city, but it was remote. It was not a, a, a treaty port city. It was not on the coast. It had its own revolutionary traditions. Um, so it became one of the three main centers with Beijing and Shanghai of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the protests of, of May and June uh, 1919. Um, I think I'm going to move straight to the conclusion. Uh, Li Jieren further did other things, but that's not so important here. Uh, so what I want to point out uh, is that this network of Chengdu classmates and the role they played in connecting the events of Versailles with national and local publics in China and Chengdu, um, well, for one, it's fascinating in its own right, in, in its own right, because it sort of takes us back from diplomatic history to people, ordinary people who were actually engaged in making public opinion and in doing uh, things that contributed to mobilizing the public. It also serves to replace the event of May 4th back into a broader continuity of space and time. So uh, what I call the Chengdu class of 1911 um, 
And these people, as I said, were all born in 1891, 92, or 95. Uh, many of them had uh, experienced the uh, uh, railroad protection movement in 1911, which was the kind of prelude to the revolution of 1911. So there was this kind of uh, <coughs> early crystallization of a modern form of public opinion. Um, which led to the expansion of the modern press, but this buildup of modern newspapers, of networks of reporters, of special funds for cable dispatches, I haven't had time to talk about the technical aspects of sending cables, which are also quite fascinating, so they would take between three and eight days, depending on how much you were willing to pay for them. Uh, we're all, uh, and ultimately, sorry, the establishment of this Chinese news agency were all crucial in providing the infrastructure for the sudden surge in public opinion of 1919. But at the same time, it's remarkable that the technology and institutions of a modern civil society relied closely on this pre-modern type of hometown networks. So without connections like the ones between Zhou Taishuan, Wang Guangqi, and Li Jiren, it's doubtful that the move May 4th movement could have spread with such effect in Sichuan and probably all around China. So in this sense, this most global event also relied on the most local connections. Thank you. Thank you for, again, a really fascinating paper. And uh, the final paper on this panel is by Jeff Wasserstrom, <laughs> who teaches Chinese and world history at the University of California, Irvine. He often writes for newspapers and magazines, as well as academic periodicals. Uh, he has co-written, written, edited, or co-edited more than 10 books, including Student Protests in 20th Century China, published by Stanford in 1992 and eight juxtapositions, China Through Imperfect Analogies from Mark Twain to Manchu Kuo, published by Penguin in 2016. So it's a great, great pleasure to be here, and I'm um, very grateful to Albert for, um, and, um, for organizing and the other organizers. It's been very stimulating so far, and I'm doubly grateful to Sebastian, who both organized the panel and lent me a sport coat so that I would be able to pass the dress code and not have to carry it with me. Um, it's, when you're giving a paper, it seems to me that to be on a panel, it's um, turnout, it's lovely turnout after a lunch with wonderful food and wine, but you should always prepare for nobody coming. And wanting to have a panel where the, uh, if the panelists were the only people listening to you, you'd feel it would be an interesting discussion, and if they were the people you were listening to, you knew you would learn things. And so I was delighted to be part of this panel, but when I'm going last, they've said so many of the things that I would have um, wanted to do, wanted to say. So I'll riff off some of them, and also in the spirit of keeping things lively, make some kind of outrageous comparisons and juxtapositions, which is the way I like to operate, beginning with who's up there on um, the, um, the screen, um, Deng Xiaoping and Emile Zola. Um, both of whom were tied by, to Paris, in my mind, um, Deng Xiaoping, because he spent time here. Um, Emile Zola, couldn't help thinking of, because walking um, down a street name for him on the way here. Um, in discussions of the May 4th movement and of China in this period, there's a tendency to zero in on one trigger of the protests, the Treaty of Versailles, one place, Beijing, um, one moment, May of um, 1919, one ideology, usually Leninism, in, uh, or the introduction of Marxism, depending who's telling the story, and one goal that was um, unfulfilled and still needs to be fulfilled of democracy. These are the kinds of things that when people um, in, in Chinese studies talk about um, um, the May 4th movement, they tend to do. All of the papers have done, in some ways, what I think is important to do, which is to decenter each of those things to talk about there being more triggers than just the treaty, more places than just Beijing, more moments than just May of 1919, more ideologies in flux um, than Leninism, and more goals than democracy. And I think all of them have, um, each of the papers have in different ways um, decentered those things. I just add that just to de-exoticize this idea of de that May 4th can be remembered 
as sort of a bunch of things squeezed together in one box. And so was it a political movement or was it um, a cultural desire? Was um, Deng Xiaoping, do you remember him because he went on to be a leader of the Chinese Communist Party and embraced Leninism? Or do you remember him as a kind of cosmopolitan youth who came to Paris and had his mind open to other ways of living in the world and things like that? And the idea is that these are both, these are all yoked together somewhat um, complexly and contentiously in the idea of the May 4th movement, which in, uh, sometimes when it's invoked in China, it can, be it can be invoked by the Communist Party to say that's what brought a strong state into being, that's what brought communism to China, or it can be evoked otherwise in saying that's what is an unfinished goal of democracy. To just kind of um, de-exoticize this, I used the example writing about it recently in the New York Times of the May 68. If you use that phrase um, you know, about Paris, um, you invoke both ideas of um, political action and of cultural, uh, cultural trends. In the United States, when you say the 60s, it can sometimes bring up images of anti-war protests, but it can also bring up images of hippies. It can bring up the idea of, of, of Marxism-Leninism or John Lennon. All those things are kind of bundled together, and it can be kind of a disjuncture when you think of them, uh, when you, get, you think of one and not another. When I saw my first pictures, uh, photographs of the Berkeley free speech movement, I was shocked that the, the male students were all neatly coiffed, short hair, and wearing very formal clothes, because in my mind they'd been bundled together with hippies. So there are things like that. And when we say that the Chinese Communist Party tries to narrow what May 4th means, that's something that's not distinctive just to all political tradition or national traditions tend to sanitize and get an officially acceptable view of the things they celebrate. In the United States, Martin Luther King has been turned into a saintly figure, but he's associated with, with hatred of racial injustice and things like his, what he said about um, economic injustice, what he said about the Vietnam War is kind of left out of the textbooks. Similarly, with the May 4th movement, some things get in and some things get out. Um, I'll tell you why, I'll get to why um, Zola and Doug Xiaoping are there um, in the course of this, but I want to do some kind of more radical decentering since there's already been some um, decentering going on. And in this case, what I want to do is decenter the year 1919, as I hinted in, um, in the, the, the question I gave, which was that in some ways, many of the things that are talked about as distinctive of, of the period of World War I were happened if you put China at the center, a lot of them happened in 1900. These are quotations from um, 1900. It is impossible to escape the conviction that a great world war has fairly begun. That term world war was used to describe the fact that armies from all different parts of the world were converging on China. It wasn't a world war in the sense of being fought in many parts of the world, it's being fought in one place, but from armies around the world. In discussing that war, which also in a year of global war, there was a war going on in uh, the Boer War in South Africa, the Philippine War, the war in the Philippines. Armies were circulating between those places. So actually, it was also a year of somewhat global war. And people observing it saw connections between them. And there were people moving from place to place. One of the, um, the wife of the German diplomat, to just give you one example, the, wife, the American wife of the German diplomat who was killed in Beijing in 1900 by a Qing soldier in league with the boxers, was already in mourning for her younger brother having been killed in the Philippines serving the American forces there. There were guns that were used to lift the siege of Ladysmith in South Africa that ended up being used to lift the siege in, uh, in Beijing. So it was a year of interconnected war. It felt like war was happening everywhere. It felt like a dramatic shift in the world order. And it seemed to, um, to many um, Chinese intellectuals, but also to some intellectuals in other places, as if things like the Hague um, laws on war were not really about creating a, a new kind of more just um, world, but were rather redistribute, were saying that um, certain powerful countries could do what they wanted and others would be constrained in other ways. The German reparations were a big issue in 1919 and 1900. Uh, 1901, um, a boxer, uh, a, the Boxer Protocol was signed to put an end to, um, to the Boxer Crisis. And the Qing Dynasty was forced to pay reparations for all losses of foreign lives and property, even though this had been a war in which many people, uh, many innocent civilians on the Chinese side had been killed. In fact, many more than um, innocent Westerners. So a sense of this being a kind of time of dividing up spoils was something that, that seemed to be carried out in 
the, 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 under the name of uh, saving civilization, but was actually something much cruder, was something that was very much on the minds of, of Chinese at the time. It was on the minds of some critics outside of China. Mark Twain saw it in those terms. Um, Tolstoy saw it in those terms. Lenin saw it in those terms, all of whom commented on, on the boxer crisis. Um, there were discussions of the fact that the rules of war had just been enacted, but they were being, um, they were being abused once the invaders came in, that the Hague Convention um, was, had been made to seem a joke, that there was a return to uh, uncivilized times of the civil uh, of the Middle Ages. This was a, a vision of a, um, a magazine of the time giving you a sense of a kind of uh, war of all um, in China. This was a political cartoon from the Times that imagined China's plight, this was a Chinese one, of being surrounded by beasts on all sides that just wanted a piece of, of them. You have the bear to the north, you have the French frog um, coming up from Southeast Asia, you have the American eagle putting its talons on the Philippines. So there's a vision of this um, as, as, a, as, as a dangerous time. This is a picture of the most famous assassination, um, a killing of the time. The German uh, minister, who I just mentioned, um, was, was, was killed. In a sense that this was something in which people s talked about high-minded principles, but there was something much cruder going on. Um, the assassin who killed the German minister was then arrested and, conv and confessed to the crime. And then he was beheaded on the same spot where the German minister had been killed. Public beheadings were often seen by Westerners at the time as a mark of China's backwardness. The fact that it wasn't ready to be part of the civilized world, you had public executions. This public execution was done at the behest of the foreign powers, particularly the Germans. So this was a way of having, in a sense, as Chinese later felt with the Treaty of Versailles, having your cake and eating it too, saying you were establishing a new order, but it looked a lot like the old order, just the question was um, who was in power. And this brings me to Emile Zola, who was reading the news about China at the time. We don't know how much exactly he was thinking about China. But on the last day of 1900, um, the last day of the 19th century, when a lot of people were saying, what kind of world are we moving into in the 20th century? And there was a lot of optimistic discussion of the 20th century being a time of, um, of international unity, comedy, and things like that, that the Paris uh, World Expo of 1900 was supposed to celebrate. Zola talked about the fact that there were new technologies, but had we really progressed? We pride ourselves on refinement, but are we, we are not nearly reclaimed from barbarism. A hundred years hence, good to have a centenary comment here, our descendants will consider us and our institutions the same contempt we vouchsafe upon the people of the Middle Ages or upon the refactory Chinese of today. China had become a symbol of backwardness, but he was saying, are we really any different? With, with events, events in French that he'd been involved with as well. Much later, getting to the other figure in my opening, Deng Xiaoping, in, uh, just to show what a mark the memory of um, the invasion of 1900 left on China, and the idea that after that invasion, it was uh, with lots of atrocities, it was China, the Chinese government, that had to pay the reparations and the unfairness of this. Um, a year after the June 4th massacre, whose 30th anniversary is about to come up, um, Deng, uh, Deng Xiaoping was speaking, and he, he said that he's familiar, he's Chinese, I'm familiar with the history of foreign aggression in China. So when I heard that seven countries had decided to impose sanctions on China, this was an economic uh, action against the massacre, so it was saying China was behaving uh, beyond the pale, he says my immediate association was to 1900, when the allied force of the eight powers invaded China. So this was a very cosmopolitan figure, but also one intensely um, patriotic for that. So kind of put this in um, context and then talk a little bit more across time if I have it. Um, there's recently been a trend to look from China to other parts of the world to things that were going on at the same time. Wilsonian moment, don't have to explain that here. The March 1st movement in Korea, something very similar, uh, re rejection of um, imperialism after, um, after the Treaty of uh, Versailles terms were, were clearly not gonna do away with colonialism there. So there's a tendency to look laterally and, um, whoops. This is the non-fatal, um, yes. non-fatal flaw. <laughs> yes, can we? Um, okay, within China, uh, so there's a tendency to look laterally. Within China, there's sometimes a tendency to look through time. So look laterally, but stick with the same moment. Or sometimes in um, Chinese discussions, there's a tendency to, um, to look forward in time from 1919. Um, so this is, um, 
this is a, a, you go forward, this is a photo of the May 4th protest itself. And it's a photograph of the statue in the middle of Tiananmen Square that's part of the Monument to the People's Heroes that shows friezes of the moments in China's past that led to the creation of the People's Republic of China to the things that are celebrated. Um, this is a, a photo actually of the, the sculptor working on the sculpture in the 1950s. He has a female model, a reminder that there were women involved in the, in the May 4th protests. Though when I gave this recently uh, a related talk, uh, with a demographer in the audience, he asked a question, said, you notice there are three women in 20, uh, out of a picture of 25 people. So there weren't many women there. It's just like the Politburo now in the Chinese Communist Party. A little better. In terms of moving forward, so the Chinese Communist Party says with something like that, if you want to understand how we got to where we are with the Communist Party in control and a new China that can stand up to other countries in the world that will never be humiliated again the way it was in 1919 by the Treaty of Versailles, the way it was in 1900 by the invasion, um, remember the May 4th movement. But there's another set of people who say the unresolved thing of the May 4th movement is democracy, who says if you want to understand current struggles for democracy, look back to 1919. Um, Joshua Wong, a leader of the Hong Kong protests, or the symbol, international symbol of them, tweeted recently um, that it, it just simply 2014, 1989, 1919, to a China-oriented uh, audience, that's clear. There were protests in 1919 against autocratic government and wanting democracy, uh, led by, by passionate youths. That happened again in 1989, and, it's happened, and then it happened in uh, Hong Kong in 2014. So there's an official and a protest tendency to look forward from 1919. And this is put forward, this is, a stat, uh, this is a poster the Chinese Communist Party put out in the 1970s to celebrate the May 4th movement. This is the monument to the people's heroes in the center of uh, Tiananmen Square that has the freeze saying, look back to 1919. This was a commemorative stamp about that freeze put out in 1989 as the 70th anniversary of the May 4th movement was coming up and the government was saying, remember what happened 70 years ago? And then students gathered and said, yes, remember what happened 70 years ago and look what's an unfulfilled promise. This was the protest at Tiananmen Square where they set themselves up right in front of the uh, statue to the heroes of 1919, saying the Communist Party celebrates that at the 1919 as their point of origin, we look back to it, we're the true inheritors of that moment. They read out a new May 4th manifesto at the square right there at that point saying, um, we, not the old men who are carrying on the official ceremony, are the, are the embodiment of that period. So the last thing I'll do is just talk about, these have already been mentioned, but I'll just mention it slightly differently because I actually began as a, a social historian as actually interested in sort of what do people do? We've heard about how 1915 um, anger at Japan over, um, over um, earlier efforts to, to take control of part of China, 1918 efforts to partly take control of China. These were precursors to the May 4th movement of 1919. Um, in terms of, of causes. They were also precursors in the sense they gave people a sense of how to act. And they provided ties between them. They reminded, <coughs> it, it gave people practice in protesting, and it also gave them ties to, to make them up. Um, Sebastian mentioned uh, native place ties, that people from uh, different parts of China form tight bonds with each other, a classmate tie, it's almost like it's fictive kinship. In 1918, I'll just mention that one, there were students in Japan who actually started the May 4th movement a year early. In May of 1918, there were rumors that there was going to be a secret deal between China and Japan. The Chinese students in Japan did almost all the things that students in China would do a year later. They held protests. They, according to some accounts, attacked the embassy in um, Japan. They said, we need to have rulers who will stand up better to Japan. And then they, went, they left Japan. And what they did when they left Japan was they went back to their native places. They spread out across the country. And they stayed in touch with each other because they bonded in Tokyo. Uh, it's a great sign of overseas uh, study being one way that you can form lifelong connections. <laughs> and so this 1919 protest broke out. It spread very quickly across the country because there were people who already knew each other. In the summer of 1918, they'd come back and started giving lectures about how uh, to try to raise people's uh, consciousness about the problems in um, uh, that were brewing. 
they did many of the same things in 1915 and in 1918 that were done in 1919. The only th other thing I'll add is in 1915, one reason for their protest was anger at Japan. Another was that Yuan Shikai was a president of the country, but he had set himself up as an emperor. <clears throat> and to the students and young intellectuals, this was China has to go forward in the world, but it's moving backward. Um, the leader is, is meant, to be, uh, meant to be a modern leader. He's acting like a pre-modern one. All right, so I've just very much sketched out why I think this kind of prehistory to 1919 matters within a detailed Chinese case. Keep in mind that one thing that was angering students besides the democracy and things like that was a sense of China sliding backwards rather than going forward. There was a trigger that set it off, but they also um, had other things on their mind that they'd had a couple of years before when they'd been kind of trying out the things that they would do later. As it turns out, each of the things that I've mentioned happening help you understand, in fact, these events that are compared sometimes to the May 4th movement. In 1989, there were specific triggers that brought people out onto the streets in 1989, but they'd already practiced protesting in 1986 and 87. One reason it could spread quickly across the country was people had established connections during that warm-up protest. One thing that led, um, that specifically angered um, the students in 1989 was that Deng Xiaoping, who presented himself as a modern leader who was moving China forward and had rejected the kind of irrationality of Mao's day, at the end of the 1986-87 protest, he'd taken his chosen successor and demoted him from office because he didn't like the fact that that su chosen successor had been too lenient on the student protests. This reminded some intellectuals and students of what Mao had done, previously changing uh, successors at his whim. In 2014 in Hong Kong, complicated thing, but I, I won't go into it, except to say that Joshua Wang, the face of the 2014 protests, he was also a veteran, although he was only in his teens, of a 2012 protest that had given many people the kind of practice that would go forward. So you have a kind of recurring pattern that isn't part of that official recurring pattern. And that allows me to end with a final shot taking us back to Deng Xiaoping, which was one of the posters that was put up in 1989, was saying, Deng Xiaoping, he leads the Communist Party, he claims to be taking a new direction beyond Mao, he actually claims to be reconnecting with a kind of cosmopolitan <laughs> openness to the world that maybe was represented by this youthful um, study abroad student in Paris. But what he's really like is the Empress Dowager of old China picking, uh, manipulating things from beyond the scenes. And if China wants to move forward, that's the last kind of leader it needs. Thanks for your attention. So thank you again to all four uh, really wonderful papers. Um, and I'd just actually like to hear the four of you be more in dialogue with one another since you have such a coherent uh, sort of idea. One, this idea of uh, diversifying this moment in May 4th. And I just had, um, so it seems like one of the ideas that crosses at least uh, Jeff Peters and Rachel's papers is this idea of the Changchun or the strong power and how, they, how it shifts at different times. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether this idea of the strong uh, the Changchun is always used as a form of critique, some sort of anti-imperial critique, or is it also sort of uh, used as a form of legitimation on the side of uh, the people who use this? And then uh, putting Rachel and uh, Sebastian's papers in dialogue, I was really struck by this idea of the networks and how these local no associations sort of take precedence over the global. And I was just wondering if you could be in dialogue too, if you see uh, the British Malay network as very different from this Paris-Beijing network. So I was particularly struck uh, by Rachel's paper when, where Confucianism is this modern force in British Malay, which among, it seems like when you hear from the Beijing perspective, Confucianism is always the thing that needs to be overcome as opposed to in, in, in British Malay. So I was just uh, basically want you four to talk to each other more. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things, I'm always interested in um, parallels across time, and they're sometimes not the parallels that uh, people are specifically thinking of, but I think there's been an enduring concern among Chinese intellectuals from before the May 4th movement on. It's like, how can we have a strong country so that we can stand up? 
And one of the ways has been to say that the way to have a strong country is to have a strong leader. A kind of strongman, muscular, nationalist leader has showed up, and we ha we're at China's right now under the thrall of one. And there's something familiar about him. I mean, in, and it's not law. The Yuan Shikai's um, image was banned from the Chinese internet because when, Deng, when Xi Jinping did away with term limits, some people started putting pictures up to say we're back with a president who's acting like an emperor. Um, but you also have then countercurrents that say in May 4th, everybody wanted China to become a strong country. It was just that you needed, the way to get strong was to embrace science and democracy. It wasn't, and, and you have recurring things of that. Um, and the other thing with localism and national, I just say, if we get away from um, national, one thing is nationalism is often said like, how can Hong Kong be nationalist if it's not a nation? But if we think of just like, I love my community and it deserves to be better governed, then you have a kind of connecting thread. And it's not just Hong Kong that has had that in a very local reading. Uh, in 1925, the first time that a group said, let's revive the May 4th spirit, it was Shanghai residents pr protesting against international uh, concessions there, and a term Shanghai uh, for the Shanghai Ren. There was a sense of that. And Mao even talked about Hunan for the Hunanese at some point. So mm -hmm. I think if we focus on love of a, of a local community and wanting uh, to be stronger, which can go in different directions. OK, one, one way I think about developments in China from the late 1890s through the 19 teens is as a kind of oscillation between a faith in direct military political action. So this is the revolutionary movement that leads to the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, 1912. And then in the actual political chaos and sort of strongman rule that emerged in 1912, is a, is a disillusionment with political action and uh, something of a consensus that might be termed a term to culture instead of politics. So there was an analysis, why did things go so wrong in the wake of the revolution? It's because China's problems are deeper than political. They're cultural, they're based on um, a, a, a sick Confucian tradition that needs to be overthrown at the level of um, beliefs and people's daily lives. But then over the course of the 19-teens, that didn't seem to be uh, working very well either. But um, this is the moment of talk about science and democracy. And if it's, if it's national, I'm not sure it's nationalism. If it is nationalism, it's a kind of very cosmopolitan uh, universalist values approach to nationalism. But then, um, in the wake of the European war, m increased, yet more increased pressures from Japan, and um, uh, the, the sort of disgrace and humiliation of how the Versailles Treaty uh, treated China, you have uh, the reemergence of political hyphen kind of militarized activism. So in terms of this uh, notion of Chang Chuan, um, there's, there's an essay by Chen Duxiu, future founder of the Communist Party, in, in toward the end of 1919, where he says, OK, yes, now we need strength, coercion, military force. The, um, the rights of the powerful are, are what we now need. Um, it's, it's nationalistic in a way that's maybe plainer than the kind of thinking of just a year or two before, um, but it still has a universal thrust to it in that he will say his, his ultimate goal is um, a kind of global justice, and he sees China as participating in um, very broadly general anti-imperialist moves. Um, uh, but moves that are not a rejection of whatever you might call Western civilization as such. Um, but it does bring us back to the uh, legitimation of coercive power that had disappeared for a while. Um, I have so much to say, but uh, <laughs> um, the, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make three, three 
comments. One on the question of power. Um, what's really fascinating about Wu Dunmin and the way that he conceptualized um, or self-determination was that he saw what he was critiquing from his anarchist background was um, the, f the fact of coercion being fundamentally Im imbued in statehood. So a lot of his critique is about um, state institutions like the military, um, the uh, governors, warlords, anything that, that symbolized kind of repressive authority. Um, and he has that critique in his class analysis before the May 4th movement. And then when, in, in early May, when the, when the movement happens, he sort of switches his tone and he starts talking about this patriotism stuff. He says, let's inflame all these patriots. And in a way, that shift becomes a kind of betrayal of that earlier um, class analysis of society. It's, it's much more brittle. As I said earlier, the anti-Japanese um, aspect of his thinking uh, didn't just couldn't have purchase in the, the stratified society um, that, that he was writing in. Um, and, and, and so in a way, he, 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 uh, he shifts to kind of prescribe strong nationalism to stand up against strong state power, but it, in the circumstances that he's diagnosing it for, it actually, it doesn't, re it doesn't really work. And, he, and then he, he is kicked back to China, and then he's reabsorbed into the Chinese nationalist narrative. And we lose that sense of kind of intellectual fluidity that was possible in these kinds of diasporic spaces. It's really interesting because he he syndic uh, on the day that he stands trial at the in the dialogue that I put up. Could you could you put my slide um, up? I, there was one slide that I passed over that I want to show as well. Um, but anyway, he he syndicates. Um, <clears throat> A really important May 4th essay by Tan Ming Tian called Aspects of Democracy. Um, he syndicates it, his stand in editor syndicates it on the day that he stands trial um, in, in, um, in Selangor. Um, and it's not, they don't put any commentary on the syndication, they just put it there and saying, look what these guys in Beijing were saying about democracy. But they're not talking about Beijing, they're talking about the specific colonial oppression that Wu Dongmin is standing up and standing trial for in the specific local space of Kuala Lumpur. And so that juxtaposition of what Xiang Chuan actually means in all these different spaces, which is why I left it untranslated. It's very hard to, it's very hard to convey, um, to, to really translate it. Um, so that's one point. Uh, the second point about networks, uh, Greg, I want to talk to you more about that. Um, the, the, the one thing I, I will say is that I, th I th I, I absolutely think it's the way to, it is the way to kind of decenter this, to, to, to kind of put the local and the global into dialogue with one another that you did so well. In the longer version of this paper, I had, um, I, I compared the way that telegraphic information about the Treaty of Versailles comes into Malaya in the English press versus the Chinese press, and those That's timelines are very disjuncted. Um, and what happens is actually when you know the Chinese press has been talking about this um, outrage for the, all the weeks leading up to 19 June when the, the things happen, the eruption of riots happen, and in the English press they're sort of blithely talking about Wilson and the peace delegates and all of that right until 19 June, and, they, and then they were like, oh my God, what's happening? But you know, in truth, these these conversations were happening in entirely kind of disparate public spheres that were, um, hmm. uh, you know, sy syncopated um, because of the different um, telegraphs that they were getting at different times. So I think that kind of thing is really interesting to, uh, to um, explore. And the last thing, I skipped over uh, this slide, but on Confucianism, um, this, uh, is a very, this is a very famous critique by, by Lu Xun, who's kind of an iconic uh, May 4 thinker, where he, he basically lambasts this guy Lim Boon Kang up here for being um, uh, a, a, someone who can't even open his mouth without saying Confucius. Um, and it is, it is people like the, May, the, the sort of radical hardline May 4thers who canonize this idea that Confucianism is the thing that Chinese modernity is, is actively getting rid of. And, and actually that, that, um, that, that is is a, a kind of uh, fiction that it doesn't even hold in China. I mean, you know, lots of scholars have shown this con continuities of and Confucianist forms of thinking well past the May Fourth Movement and well before it. But the, the point is that in these diasporic spaces, um, that that critique uh, especially doesn't hold because people like Lim Boon King are able to kind of flip back and forth between uh, different sorts of um, intellectual identities. Um, so up there, you have him in, in, in his dapper kind of European guys in the legislature. Legislative Council, and then you have him commissioning a painting in 1940 by another Nanlai um, uh, painter, Xu Bei Hong, uh, who went to South, the South Seas and commissions um, a, pic, a painting, very large painting of, of Confucius and his students, but asks him to make me look like Confucius. Right? What do we do with people like this? What, you know, uh, um, 
you know, Western modernity doesn't know how to talk about these people. Um, and, and it's one of the, the, the reasons for kind of thinking about provincializing uh, our genealogies of, of, of the modern um, by, by kind of digging up people that are like this who don't fit into either the Chinese patriotic modern mode or this kind of Western mm -hmm. idea that everybody's going to become an American Democrat. Right, thanks. <laughs> Well, what can I say after that? Um, yeah, maybe really just a few very short points. Um, uh, right, I mean, I tried to highlight the ideological diversity of these, of these people, and they were, none of them were really, I mean, it's very hard to, to, to say that they were really unified by a common belief. Uh, their political trajectories are so divergent. Uh, they're even, I mean, I tried to pick photos that showed them also in different attire. So you see Li Ren in his uh, sort of literati gown. You see the sort of uh, westernized gentleman. And then you see the future eugenics professor working at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So uh, they, I mean, those, those things all sketch out very different trajectories. And they, but they had other forms of solidarities that I think were uh, just as important. I mean, maybe we, we, this is something, I mean, this has been ongoing in historiography, rethinking the connection between intellectual history and social history, but this is one of the aspects that ideas are not only about ideas, ideas are also about how you get, how you come into touch with those ideas and with whom you hear about certain ideas and so on and so on. So um, definitely want to talk more about those networks. Um, Confucianism maybe not per se, but also similar, I mean, um, yeah, I, I won't go into that. Uh, uh, just on Chen, and this this may be also the essay that Peter mentioned. Um, I think Chen Duxiu wrote uh, uh, in this essay on the Shandong question uh, that the two things we learned in Versailles is that uh, we should not rely on universal principles to solve our problems, right? On Gongli, and uh, the other one is we we can't we can't rely on other people to solve our problems, right? Something like that. So. Uh, uh, but he doesn't say we need to take things into our own hands and sort of uh, gun down our enemies and so on. So at least among these Chengdu people I've looked at, I don't see this kind of endorsement of power politics in, in their own, uh, uh, for, for their own goals. I'm so, I'm so, thank you again for the, sorry we're running a little out of time, so um, we're gonna move to just a really quick five minute break, but before we do that, I just want to thank again the four wonderful papers and the four wonderful panelists for giving four wonderful papers. I'm sure we can have more uh, questions uh, during the, the short break that we have. Thank you. Thank you.